What is the Schomburg Center? To me, it is home. The place where we come to see who we really are, not just somebody else's reflection of who we are. The Schomburg Center is a place of culture, it's a place of history, it's a place of knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is a repository of all of the things that has documented our sense of worth as a people. For me, that means that it is a place of immense power. The Schomburg Center is a public research library and a cultural institution. For the study of the Pan-African world, it is perhaps the best in the world. My Schomburg Center is Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. Arturo Schomburg said, Black history and culture and intellect exists at a time when most people didn't believe that. He collected those evidences, and that became the beginning of the collection. And it has expanded and has grown to where it is now a world-class institution. It holds over 10 million items. There's no parallel anywhere that brings to light what we as people of color have done, what we continue to do. Black culture is all of culture. The universals that animate everyone's life happen here for all people. The Schomburg for me is one of the center pillars of Harlem. When I started the journey of finding out about Red Rooster and Harlem, the very first place I went to was the Schomburg. Researchers from around the world come and use what we have here. I could not have written just about any of the books that I've written without the Schomburg Center's archives, resources. The Schomburg Center is much more than a library. We encourage lifelong learning and exploration. The Junior Scholars Program is a Saturday program with students from fifth grade to senior year in high school to help them learn about black history and culture. Learning about my history is important because it teaches me who I am. The Schomburg Junior Scholars Program is going to do nothing but uplift them. So many talented and brilliant people have walked the corridors of this amazing institution over the years. From Octavia Butler to Toni Morrison and James Baldwin, Ella Fitzgerald, Alvin Ailey, 
and Harry Belafonte, who graced the stage in this room of the American Negro Theater. This place evokes great memories. It was a gift to us in our community to really try to find that space to reflect expressions of black experience. I just knew that the environment, what I saw these young African Americans doing, was a place I needed to be. What is my Schomburg Center? I'm standing here at the Cosmogram, which underneath holds the ashes of the poet Langston Hughes. On the evening when this Cosmogram was dedicated, people began to empty out of the auditorium. A jazz trio struck up, and to my amazement, Amira Baraka went over and asked Maya Angelou for a dance. And they started to dance on top of the Cosmogram, on top of the ashes of Langston Hughes, and I felt what a fitting way to kiss the memory of Langston. The Schomburg Center is a research institute and a library, but it's so much more than that. There's something going on every day. So many amazing people come here to talk about their creative craft, to share what inspires them. The Schomburg Center's collections help to tell stories even beyond our walls. The Schomburg Center is here in this exhibition at MoMA, One Way Ticket, Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series. We depend on the resources of the Schomburg to enable us to tell this story. Thinking about the implications of the past on the present is absolutely crucial for understanding the next steps, understanding what we have to do to go forward. We today have the responsibility of making sure that new artists and activists, new scholars and poets know that this place continues to be a resource and a source of inspiration for the work that we must continue to do. The Schomburg Center is knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is education. The Schomburg Center is home. It is family. It is foundational. The Schomburg Center is inspiration. The Schomburg is with me in everything that I do. Community, inside and out. The Schomburg Center is us. The Schomburg Center is you. And we invite each and every one of you to find your Schomburg Center. Welcome. It's great to be here and it's great to have you here with us. This is the 11th season of Conversations in Black Freedom Studies. Kamozi Woodard and I started Conversations in Black Freedom Studies in collaboration with the Schomburg Center more than a decade ago to create a space where the public could engage with new works in Black social movement history. Three years ago, Robin Spencer Antoine joined the team and Kamozi has taken a more emeritus role. With fewer and fewer public spaces to engage with new work in Black history, Conversations in Black Freedom Studies was conceived of and continues to be a way to hear, to learn, to discuss, to think about new work in Black history together that helps us see the present more clearly. We are so very pleased and honored that the Schomburg Center has continued the series as one of its educational and public programming offerings. We are grateful for Lucien Baskin, who is our outreach and social media coordinator for the series, and to Park Boulevard, who does the tech, the back end of the tech of what you're seeing tonight. Please follow us at Schomburg CBFS or at our website, blackfreedomstudies.org. Our next conversation, so we're always on the first Thursday, for those of you who've been with us for many years, will again be online. Um, so Thursday, May 2nd, for a conversation on educational injustice and the struggle for liberatory education with Zebulon Maletsky, Connor Thomas-Reed, Keith Mays, and Leslie Alexander. Now on to you, Robin. Welcome to our conversation. Uh, tonight, we're going to take a close look at Black Lives at leisure, at sports, and at food as crucial space for spaces for asserting Black life and well-being. We're so delighted to be together for this online uh, conversation that couldn't be more timely. This is a moment of political organization and uprising alongside critical conversations about Black joy, survival, and daily life. 
That has been the goal of conversations from its very beginning, 11 years ago. The history that we need to see the way forward. And tonight we couldn't be more thrilled to bring together speakers that will allow us to see every day in new ways. I'm delighted to introduce our panelists. Their books are available in the Schomburg shop and in Harlem. Um, we'll put the link in the chat if you're not local and uh, you'll be able to get them online. So Dr. Teresa Runzler is an associate professor of history at American University and the author of Black Ball, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Spencer Haywood, and the generation that saved the soul of the NBA. Dr. Bobby J. Smith II is an assistant professor of African-American studies at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He's author of Food Power Politics, the food story of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. And our third speaker is Dr. Ava Perkis, an assistant professor of women and gender studies and American culture at the University of Michigan and author of Fit Citizens, a history of black women's exercise from post reconstruction to post-war America. Welcome everyone. Where we'd like to start is just briefly where you started. How did you come to this research topic? What concerns or commitments or experiences, questions guided your work here? And Teresa, we'll start with you. Great. I first off want to say thanks so much to Jean and Robin for inviting me to be part of this. I have done so much research at the Schomburg. I have read your work over the years and assigned your work in my classes, so it's a real honor to be here. Um, so I've been writing about sport since I was a graduate student, and in fact, my first book, which grew out of my dissertation, uh, titled Jack Johnson, Rebel Sojourner, examines the international impact of the first Black world heavyweight champion in the early 1900s as both a Black and anti-colonial icon. And that project actually came out of both my interest in transnational politics and what it might look like from below. And also, too, I grew up in Kitchener, Ontario, which... Um, unbeknownst to many people, was the site of um, a very large uh, contingent of Black boxers from Canada, including Lennox Lewis, who went on to medal in international competitions, and I trained with a couple of them. And so I really wanted to tell a story that paid homage to all of the work that they did um, in advancing uh, Black Canada. Um, and I actually worked in the field of sport and entertainment before I went back to graduate school. So I started out in public relations at a national sports network in Toronto, Canada. Um, and also back in the mid to late 1990s, way back when I used to have abs, I performed for the Toronto Raptors dance pack. So I was an NBA dancer. Um, and what a lot of people don't understand about NBA dancers is that those dance teams are often a gateway into the professional dancing um, scene in the cities where they're located. So those three years, 1996 to 1999, um, I was a part of the dance team. I saw the behind the scenes workings of a franchise. Um, and I'm normally a quiet person by nature. So I just sort of observed and I took notice of all sorts of things, um, both on and off the court, behind the scenes, you know, how the concessions worked, how it was determined, who would sit where, you know, how seat licenses were purchased, et cetera, and all of the racial and labor dynamics associated with those things. Um, and in some respects, I feel like the book, um, my second book, Black Ball, is kind of like decades in the making um, as I wanted to unpack all of the things that I observed when I was in my early 20s. I was a college student at the time, just trying to pay my bills. I didn't really have a kind of historical or theoretical framework for understanding what I was seeing. Um, but during that time, I really noticed that 
sport was definitely more than just play. Sport is, at the end of the day, a business. Um, and I began to see that athletes, as I was a professional dancer at the time, we are workers, we are laborers. Um, and so you have to understand the labor politics of doing that kind of work. Um, and I also became very aware that sport is not just this exceptional space that's outside of politics. Sport is, in fact, a form of embodied politics. It's, it's intertwined with the law, business, culture, every kind of avenue of um, our society. Yeah, um, and thank you, uh, Jean. I also want to thank you, Jean and Robin, as well, for the invitation to be a part of this conversation. Um, I've been thinking about Black people's historical relationship to agriculture and food, um, at least since I was an undergraduate student um, at Historically Black College in Texas, known as Prairie View A&M University, right, 45 minutes northwest of Houston, um, where I studied agriculture and agricultural economics. So I've always been thinking about how the ways in which particularly Black farmers or Black people engage in conversations or in politics around attempting to address their agricultural and food needs. But also, I've been thinking about the relationship through my family. Uh, both my mother and my father are both from the rural South, and both of them grew up on farms up until a certain age. My father um, on cotton farms and my mother on tobacco farms. Um, so I've been thinking about this relationship between Black people and agriculture and food um, for a while now. So, but, so when I think about my journey towards or how I came to writing Food Power Politics, the food story of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement, I feel like my academic journey and my family's journey brought me to the moment to write this particular book. Uh, but the ideas for this book was actually born when I was a graduate student at Cornell University taking a class on community organizing and development. I'm a sociologist by training with a background in agricultural economics. So when I approach this question around food and power, I'm thinking about it sociologically. Um, so I was taking this class on community development and organizing. Um, the seminar class, classic seminar, and I was assigned Charles Payne's book, I've Got the Light of Freedom. I'm a seminal text on the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement, groundbreaking work, pathbreaking work. And, and during that time, I was thinking about a dissertation project around what we were calling food justice. At the time, food justice was a, a, a newer term. So food justice is um, a social movement that uses food and agriculture as a vehicle to address inequities in the production, consumption, and distribution of food. So when I was in the seminar class, our professor always asked us to always think about the text that we're reading, but through the prism of our own dissertation project. So again, I so I had been assigned Charles Payne's book to present in class on um, that particular week. So if anyone's read Charles Payne's book, we know that Payne's book is about 400 pages. So I'm reading through Payne's book, chapter one, two, three, four, not finding anything related to this idea of food justice that I was interested in studying. And it wasn't until chapter five of Payne's book, roughly 10 pages in chapter five, where I learned about the ways in which food entered the story of the civil rights movement. But food and enter the civil rights movement, the ways in which we think about food in Black life, and particularly around the cultural aesthetics around Black life. We think about recipes and food. We think about uh, particularly uh, growing food and things of that nature. But when I read Payne's book, food entered the story um, as a weapon against civil rights activists in their communities. But Payne also told a story about the ways in which activists and communities responded. So I became interested in really thinking about how does this moment that I knew nothing about, I never thought about food in the civil rights movement. I knew about voting rights. I knew about education. I knew about access to a public accommodation and segregation, but I never thought about how food took center stage in the movement. And after reading Payne's book, I took that little story he told in chapter five, and I followed the story throughout many archives across the nation, mostly in Mississippi. And that, and that, that gave birth to the book, Food Power Politics, the food story of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. That was lovely, Bobby. Um, also want to echo my co-panelists. Thank you so much, Jean and Robin and Lucian and Mei Lee for all of your work. Um, I'm really honored to be 
virtually at the Schomburg um, doing this. And I'm very, very lucky to be part of this panel. Um, so just like Bobby and Teresa, I came to the subject of Black women's exercise as a scholarly project in graduate school. Um, but I entered that uh, subject from a different perspective. Um, I came to graduate school wanting to study Black women's domestic labor. Like, I was very intent on that. I considered myself like a labor historian, and um, my advisor lovingly disavowed me <laughs> of, of that. But um, over time, I came to realize that I actually was not interested in the labor that Black women did for others. I was actually interested in the labor that Black women did for themselves. And so I wanted to think about how did Black women kind of like move their bodies for themselves and exercise seemed like the most fitting prism with which to understand less intuitive um, kinds of Black mobility, Black physicality, and Black embodiment. And I came to realize I'm really interested in thinking about um, counter narratives of the Black body, so to speak, right? Um, and so I started looking in the archives. I found um, mounds and mounds of evidence and um, no monograph had been written on this. I thought it was really interesting. And so I was off to the races um, in a kind of scholarly sense. But I also had some experiential perspectives that I think buoyed my interest and my approach that I didn't realize until recently. Like it wasn't that um, conscious at the time, but looking back now retrospectively, I see how my experiences, just like Bobby, right? Like thinking about farms and thinking about your life and Teresa, you um, being in the industry um, fomented my interest. So when I was in college, I worked many summers at a gym that you all might remember called Curves. Do you all remember Curves, the gym for women? <laughs> so I worked at Curves and this was a franchise. It was a nationwide gym and it was exclusive to women. So men were not um, permitted to join and really men were not permitted to even enter the gym. And so I had many experiences being ensconced and drenched in this environment where women were always working out. Um, so there was that piece. And then after I graduated from college, I ended up working at a weight loss center. And I promise all of this was happenstance. I did not plan it. I wasn't trying to be in the fitness industry. Um, so I was, I interviewed, I got the job and I was placed in kind of like the low income weight loss center. Um, and I don't know, I would say maybe 95% of the clients were black and brown folks, right? So dozens and dozens and dozens of the clients were African-American, Afro-Caribbean and Latinx people. And these are folks that have all kinds of reasons and motivations for wanting to improve their health and lose weight and things like that. So what I think that those experiences did for me, in addition to the kind of intellectual imperative, was to normalize like Black women, and like many of the clients at that center were Black women, was to normalize Black women's um, investment in and fidelity to Black fitness. And that really bumped up against dominant narratives and common sense assumptions about Black women's kind of alienation from fitness. So I think that those, now looking back, I think that those experiences working in the industry um, and also some of my interests about um, surprising uh, narratives about Black embodiment all came together to form my interest and in eventually the production of this book. Thank you for sharing all of those stories. I mean, that's, I think, the, a fabulous and really interesting window into your past and also your, you know, the root of some of what uh, germinates in, in your books. So I really appreciate that share. I wanted to give you the opportunity to teach us something, giving, you know, give us 
a window into your work. Um, bring us into the Black world that you are showing in your, your books. What is the intervention that your book is making into this era? And how is it connected to larger notions of Black freedom making? I will start with you, Bobby. Yeah, thank you, Robin, uh, for the question. I think the best way for me to uh, even begin to, to attempt to answer this question is I'll read uh, just the first paragraph of the conclusion of my book where I think it gets to um, what you're saying around, like telling a story around the book and what I'm trying to convey. So the first paragraph of the conclusion, I'm on page 141. Am I right? I began this book with the words of Black chef Omar Tate. Food is a weapon that has been used against us, but food is also a shield. Tate's words, which echo the words of activist Fannie Lou Hamer and others before her, offer us a different pathway to think about the relationship between Black people and food, calling explicit attention to the multiple uses of food to enforce and resist inequality in Black life. The first part of Omar Tate's quote, food is a weapon that's been used against us, tell the story of food power, that illuminates how food is transformed into a site of inequality designed to harm Black people. The other part, but food is also a shield, points to a story of what I call emancipatory food power that authorizes Black people to use food as a site of social, political, and economic change that can protect them from food as a form of inequality. For some, the first story of oppression has been rehearsed too often and does not offer a blueprint for how to overcome such oppression. For others, the second story helps us more today by showing how Black people created food mechanisms to free themselves, even if temporarily from oppression. But the contours of both stories, when read together, unveil a collage of food stories about food power politics in Black life that has been dormant. In the context of the civil rights movement, these food stories are part of what prominent activists Bob Moses and Charlie Cobb describe as an important dimension of the movement that has been almost completely lost in the imagery of hand clapping, song field rallies for protest demonstrations that have come to define portrayals of the 1960s civil rights meetings, dynamic individuals using their powerful voices to inspire listening crowds. What I'm attempting to do in my book is I'm attempting to offer a different narrative of the civil rights episode of the civil rights movement. Oftentimes when it's rehearsed, food is often in the backdrop. And what I what I started to do in my project is bring food to the forefront. And how I did that was by developing a theoretical framework to recover this in narratives around the civil rights movement. So the title of my book is Food Power Politics, but it's also the, the name of the framework I created to recover this food story of the Mississippi civil rights movement. Food Power Politics builds on what political scientists, historians, and, and, and our legal scholars call this idea of food power. Food power is a moment uh, during social conflict whereby one nation withholds food from another nation in times of conflict in order to mitigate the impact of the conflict. I took that concept and I transposed it into everyday Black life. But as I was using everyday Black life in the movement, and as I was using this food power framework, I realized that it failed to capture how Black people were responding. Black people never lay dormant or, or, or Black people never find themselves being passive in times of social struggle, particularly not in the Black freedom struggle, for sure. So what I did was I, re I realized that they were doing what I call emancipatory food power, where they were counter weaponizing food as a way to address food being weaponized against them. So the tensions between food power and emancipatory food power create what I call food power politics. And I argue in my book that the food story of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement is the quintessential example of what I'm calling food power politics in my project. Thank you. Bobby, I have so many questions. I wish we could all just be in conversation. <laughs> oh, that was so scintillating. Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, I think one intervention that's maybe a little understated in my book that I'm trying to make is to complicate a little bit um, struggles for citizenship and more broadly struggles for black freedom as not just struggles against white oppression, but also intra-racial struggles, intra-racial discourse, intra-racial conflict. And to think about these campaigns and struggles for citizenship and freedom and liberation as 
not just binary and good and good or bad, but like some good elements and some not so savory elements, right? Um, and so um, one way that I try to complicate this is to center these black public health interventionists activists that advocated for exercise, right? Um, these were men and women, but principally women who believed in like the health value of exercise. They thought that it was imperative and should be integrated into black public health campaigns. And they zeroed in on a particular sector of the black population that they believed really needed exercise. And these were young women that they deemed round shouldered girls, round shouldered girls. And according to them, these were young women who had like stooped over shoulders. They had low energy, poor health. They were exceptionally thin or exceptionally paunchy and overweight. They had flat chests and they overall looked and emitted um, an, an image of unhealthfulness and unfitness. And they were also very worried about what it would mean for their children and what it would mean for the black race, right? So you kind of see where I'm going with this. Um, and again, these were women who cared very much about um, the status of black life and black health. And they were really thinking about ways to intervene. So like Bobby, I'm gonna read like a very short piece because um, I'm a better writer than extemporaneous. <laughs> speaker, um, just to kind of get at the conflict and the messiness of this campaign for Black health and Black fitness and Black citizenship. So this is in chapter two on page 75. <clears throat> Anxieties about Black round-shouldered girls expose the fraught nature of exercise-infused public health work. Fixing the round-shouldered girl served as a method for Black people to distance themselves from both the stigma of poor health and the present and impending dangers of physical deformity. Avoiding stigma, addressing real health concerns, and thinking of posterity became intertwined in the eugenic public health landscape of the early 20th century. It is difficult to disentangle the ways in which public health programs allowed African Americans to both materially improve Black health and dream of positive racial destiny. Their public health work vacillated between a problematic elitist venture and a campaign that allowed Black people to imagine a different future for themselves. The complex health-informed struggle for citizenship created these entanglements of good intentions, negative implications, material benefits, and hopes for a better future. So in some, it was messy, right? These Black women, public health interventionists and exercise advocates were invested first and foremost in saving Black lives. They wanted Black people to have um, healthy, long lives, they were thinking about Black futurity, and at the same time, they're trafficking in Black eugenic thought. And so one of the things that I'm trying to do is say, you know, we have to kind of take all of it and think about these figures as complicated, ambivalent figures that are still working towards Black freedom, Black citizenship, and Black liberation. And we have to figure out ways to kind of hold all of it together. So that is <laughs> that is one of the interventions that I hope that I, I made in the book is to complicate and add some complexity to how we think about and conceive of these historical actors that are working toward Black health liberation. Teresa, I'm so, I'm so on the edge of my seat to hear what you have to say about the intervention in your book. Um, thanks so much, Ava. And I, I was actually just going to say, when I was reading the first couple chapters of your book, I was thinking to myself, this is so wild that the, <laughs> that the public conversation around, quote unquote, rolled round, short, shouldered women 
is happening at the same time that you have the rise of these, you know, uh, you know, folks who are being described as superhuman, hyper physical, you know, Jack Johnson, Joe Lewis, et cetera. And right, the discourse then turns to be about their lack of intelligence as a way of mitigating their, you know, their physical prowess. So it's just fascinating to look at how race, gender, and class all sort of come together and create this soup of white supremacist ideologies. Um, but I'm actually gonna move forward in time. And I'm assuming that most who are watching this probably are familiar with that uh, Black Power salute um, by Tommy Smith and John Carlos that they made on the podium at the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City. Of course, at this, I iconic moment of what sociologist and athletic activist Harry Edwards calls the revolt of the Black athlete. Um, and it was a revolt that happened against the backdrop of the civil rights Black power era. Um, and so a lot of the historical scholarship on Black athletes as activists or as, you know, folks who are bringing about change whether it's in the sports industry itself or it's beyond the, the industry of sport, it usually ends at that iconic moment. Um, and I wanted to know what happened after the revolt. Um, and I could say the same in terms of our public memory of the civil rights black power era of the labor movement. It's like the 1970s, you know, at least when I was coming through graduate school, was like a wasteland. It's like nothing happened. Everything declined. You know, everything ended. And we sort of look back to the 1960s as this moment of incredible change. And then the 70s as this descent into some kind of decline and, um, you know, disorganization. Um, and what I ended up finding was actually that the energy that fueled the revolt of the black athlete was carried into the professional leagues by athletes who you know came of age during the civil rights and black power movements and the revolt of the black athlete more specifically i was also interested in you know the fact that again with these histories of sport we often posit the moment of desegregation so jackie robinson or the desegregation of the national basketball association in the 1950s as you know here we've arrived you know race is is less of an issue um but what i found was that as black players in this post civil rights moment became in fact the majority on the court in professional basketball, that it was a double-edged sword. So on the one hand, you had Black athletes who became images of success for some, certainly among um, <laughs> members of the Black community, but then also images or emblems of Black pathology. Black pathology is associated with the urban crisis. Um, violence, drug use, um, you know, just not having discipline, being lazy, et cetera. And you can see this all through the coverage of Black athletes. So let me give you an example. And I'm going to talk about Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. My students sometimes don't know who he is. So it's just like a, it's like a knife turning in my heart when I find out that they don't actually know who he is. Um, he was somebody who actually boycotted the 68 Olympics. And he said very publicly, I didn't go to Mexico City because I didn't want to, you know, give the impression that I supported white American racism on the world stage. Um, and so back in the early 1970s, he was part of the Milwaukee Bucks, seven foot two center, completely dominated the college game, came into the professional leagues also dominated in the professional leagues. Um, and he carried that spirit of defiance, again, into the NBA. 
And one of the things that I really like about his story is that he really pushed back on the expectations of white fans and white reporters. So for example, in uh, press conferences and interviews, if you thought your question was stupid, which if you've ever watched a presser, a sports presser, most of the questions are pretty banal and like, come on now, you really want me to answer that? He would actually kind of just either give a one word answer or he would grunt. I mean, he sort of makes me think of Marshawn Lynch. You know, I'm only I'm only here so I don't get fined. I'm only here so I don't get fined, right? Kareem Abdul-Jabbar perfected that in the early 1970s. Um, and he refused to play by the, the typical rules of etiquette of white reporters and fans um, that the expectations of black athletes that they had. So be humble, be grateful, be cheerful, be accessible. And above all, of course, be apolitical. Now, um, unlike Black athletes from the previous generation, many of whom were concerned about crossover, um, you know, acceptance from white fans, uh, Al Cinder, then Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, he was an unapologetically Black athlete. So he talked about the fact that his favorite book was the autobiography of Malcolm X. Um, he listened to the experimental jazz of Miles Davis. He converted to Sunni Islam, changed his name. Um, he studied African history and languages. And, you know, he called out white racism, but he wasn't a militant in the same vein as, say, the Black Panthers. But what he did do was he endeavored to be his own man, to explore and also define his evolving sense of blackness and black power on his own terms. So he became this kind of athletic icon of black self-determination. Um, and there are so many other examples in this book of black players really challenging the white controlled sports industry in the 1970s on different levels, both on and off the court, how they played playground ball. That's not following the fundamentals of basketball. You know, off the court, how they dressed themselves, how they carried themselves, what they said to the media, and also in literal court battles. There were a series of antitrust cases in the early 1970s that radically reshaped the power dynamics between the players and the team owners. And Black players were, you know, the ones who led those fights. They exposed everything from blacklisting to um, the injustices of uh, the draft rules of the NBA. They even took down the reserve clause, which essentially for a long time, there was a reserve clause in professional um, contracts that would keep a player bound. It was a form of economic bondage, contractual bondage that kept a player bound to one team for the entirety of their career, unless the team decided to dispense with them. And, you know, through their organization and their court case, their lawsuit, they ended up bringing down that rule. Um, and of course, this, what, this came at a price. There was an incredible backlash um, against the players. Um, but suffice it to say, they were very strategic in figuring out where are the levers of control, how can we actually frame our struggle in order for it to get seen by the courts and for us to gain public favor at the very same time that labor movements were being decimated in other areas? So that's, you know, I really wanted to understand what helped them actually win those things that reshaped the industry. Again, a, a beautifully dovetailed set of responses. I want to know more about all the things, the rounded shouldered women. I think I, we need more on that. Um, thank you for bringing in Charles Payne's history and the impact of his work. And I'm really fascinated this idea of using these frameworks about food power and bringing it into Black people's everyday lives. Because I feel like, I mean, right now the news is filled with the impact of food 
and delivery of food at the time of war and all the implications of that. So I think your work couldn't be more relevant. And Viva Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. We're gonna have a moment after my next question um, where you can uh, ask each other questions. I feel like there's so much, so much, it's so rich. So I'll just turn it over to Jean for the next question. So, the, I mean, this is a great conversation. And, and one of the things we had wanted for tonight um, obviously we are conversations in black freedom studies, but I think part of what we're doing tonight is looking at, at more everyday practices and everyday life as a way to think about black freedom making. Um, and as Robin was just saying, these are topics really relevant to where we are today. And so always we want, we want to talk about how the history that each of you are bringing help us see the present and the future more clearly. Um, and so if you could maybe offer something from your work that, that helps us see, see the way forward. Um, and maybe Ava, could you start? Jean, that's a big question. I just want to acknowledge I know. The, the girth of that question. <laughs> Um, and can you do it in three minutes? Okay. <laughs> yeah, oh, yes, I will do it in three minutes. Um, oh my goodness. So something that the the um, women in my book have made apparent to me is the central the centrality of black health as a like central analytic and organizing principle of black life because um, for them black health was about the present and for them if we did not privilege health as a centralizing figure there would be no black future for them right that's how they conceived of um the benefits of exercise is that it helped to increase black health and with black health we have a better black present and an actual black future and i think like a provocation that i have not a argument, but a provocation that I have is what would it mean to take their lead and to think about Black health as a centralizing analytic and as an organizing principle of Black life? Um, that is how I actually, pardon me, think about um, the Black past. That's how I think about black relationality. That's how I relate to other folks. Um, and that is also how I think about black futures. Um, and what is really interesting is at the time that they, the early 20th century and the mid 20th century, at the time that they are um, doing all of this public health campaigning and exercise advocacy, um, communicable and infectious diseases are their number one concern. Tuberculosis and typhoid fever, they're terrified of these illnesses, right? And we have gotten into a, a, a point in this country, at least, where we're um, concerned about chronic illnesses, and we should be. But now we have, since 2020, we are also back to being concerned about communicable and infectious diseases like COVID. And so I'm thinking about what it would mean to make health, how we feel in our bodies, wellness, all of that, a centralizing principle in terms of organizing, in terms of activism, in terms of research. And the reason that it's a provocation and not an argument is that, you know, Teresa can say, excuse me, Black uh, sport can be an organizing principle and analytic. Do you see what's happening in women's basketball right now? Like sport is so central to our American identity. Bobby can say, are you kidding me? You have to eat, right? Uh, food can be an organizing principle. It can be a central analytic to our research, how we envision Black futures, all of this. Um, so that is why my, it's not an argument because it's a weak argument that I can make. But I think, um, you know, every, almost every Black woman that I love has a chronic illness, almost everyone. And so that is how I think about Blackness. That's how I think about Black womanhood. That's how I think about freedom. That's how I think about futurity. And so something to kind of leave us with, to guide us in how to think about 
black freedom in the present and the future is to um, privilege um, and meditate on health as a central kind of organizing principle. Um, so that's that's kind of how I would answer that question. I'd be curious to hear about my co-panelists and how they would think about that. I feel like, do I need to answer the question anymore? <laughs> Um, you kind of did it for me. But when you were talking, it made me think of a piece that I wrote for another publication about Black women on the front lines of the mental health conversation in sports. So Naomi Osaka, you know, and others who basically just said, this is ridiculous. What you are asking me to do is actually harming me psychically, spiritually, and physically. Um, so for me, you know, those types of stories, the stories of uh, the young men in Black Ball all point to the various forms of damage that are harm baked into the sports industrial complex. So in some ways, I'm thinking about sports as a way of understanding how, you know, these systemic oppressions come together in these very, you know, central institutions of American life. Um, so how, how the sports industrial complex disciplines, you know, Black athletes says something about the harm that is being produced by the other for-profit industries, right, that we're all involved in, whether it's the academic industrial complex or, you know, the food and, you know, agribusiness or the fitness industry as a kind of capitalist project. And that's really how I think sports can actually offer us a unique window onto the workings of um, racial power dynamics. You know, sports are businesses. They're just like any other uh, corporations. Um, and yet the leagues often do everything that they can to mask the fact that they are at base for-profit entities. And they're often attempting to portray themselves as humanitarian organizations. They're using black figures. Jay-Z, you know, in the NFL to sort of cover up, you know, their own, uh, you know, complicity in American racism. Um, and it brings me back to, and this was definitely a bucket list moment for me. My book was reviewed by The New Yorker and they called it one of the most politically truthful books on basketball. Now, what I took away from that um, was that I didn't actually set out to expose the NBA at all. That wasn't the point of the project. Um, but when I focused on the struggles and concerns of the majority Black labor force that made up the league in the 1970s, told their stories, told their struggles, it automatically revealed <laughs> pro basketball's own history of racism and monopolistic business practices. On the flip side, it also revealed how the players were able to individually and collectively work together to challenge that status quo. Um, so all of this is to say that I think that looking at any U.S. institution or industry, and often the ones who are actually working in those industries have the most cogent critiques, right? Whether it be fitness, sport, food, healthcare, et cetera, if you look at them with a critical eye, you pay attention to the racial, gender, and class dynamics that drive these institutions, at the same time realizing that Things can change with individual and collective effort. It might be iterative. It might be, you know, just a slow accumulation of small victories, radical incrementalism. You know, that gives us a sense of how 
you know, even the smaller battles that we're fighting, you know, um, in today's world, we might not understand the full significance of them, but they could have genuine significance 20, 30 years from now. And you see that in particular with the explosion of discussion among WNBA players, NBA players, calling for Black Lives Matter and having the space to be able to do that and the labor protections and the support of, you know, uh, protesters beyond the sport, that all, you know, came out of this earlier moment of activism that made the conditions, the working conditions for that activism to actually flower. Now it's always in danger of being co-opted, but I think, you know, again, it's that it's that ability to sort of take these institutions, pick them apart, look at how they work, and do that with an eye to those who are really carrying the burden of them um, at the most basic level. Yeah, building on both uh, Teresa and Abe, uh, um, big question, but I do think I have a way to, to kind of begin to at least answer uh, the question. Um, in my book in particular, as I was writing uh, the book and thinking about more of the traditional civil rights historical period, people kept asking me about what was going on today. Every time I would say, well, I've discovered this new thing about the past where food takes center stage in the movement, and I'm so I'm so happy about sharing this with people. And, and all the time I get the question, okay, this is nice, but what about today? So if food was important to the civil rights movement, how does it speak to today? So I thought about it as I was writing the book. So I so so my book is situated in rural Mississippi in what we call the Yazoo Mississippi Delta region of the state, which is the Northwest Quadrant state of Mississippi. A uh, very agricultural, very rural, very black, uh, but also very racist. So you have all these things happening in the same place. Um, so as I was thinking about this project, I wanted to know were people still doing food work today in Mississippi? So in reading my book in chapter four, I fast forward to the present. Because there were so many lingering questions I had about food and the civil rights movement. So in my book, I not only talk about the ways in which Black people use food as a way to, um, to promote different ideas of freedom, but I also showed how food had been weaponized against them. And in chapter two, I talk about how the federal food stamp program was transformed into a site for food to be used as an economic weapon against African-American communities. So I speak about that chapter in particular because the book does two things that, well, at least two things that speaks to the present. The first thing it does with chapter two in bringing in the federal food stamp program is that even today, right now, we find ourselves in a farm bill year. So right now, the USDA is having many, many conversations about the future of federal food programs that feed people who are what we call food insecure. So my book provides an historical context for understanding some of these farm bill conversations and also also shows how the civil rights movement can be useful in addressing even food conversation. So it, it allows the portability of the civil rights movement to also speak to these congressional conversations we're having right now in the food stamp program, or what we call SNAP today, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, is always at the chopping block. But by understanding the history of the program, we understand why it's at the chopping block, because it's always a conversation about who uses the federal food stamp program. And what's missing from that conversation are those who actually benefit on the other side of the power struggle around food stamps. And chapter two of my book does that. But then chapter four, I fast forward and I talk about the ways in which rural Black youth today are continuing the food story of the Mississippi civil rights movement, how they are addressing inadequacies around the production, consumption, and distribution of food. And what I find interesting is that the youth provide us a roadmap to the future. And to be clear, Black youth have always done this, but to think about Black youth explicitly today, drawing on sometimes unconsciously what particularly Black folks were doing in the civil rights movement with food. So in chapter three of the book, I talk about the ways in which activists created a farm cooperative, similar to Fannie Hamer's Freedom Farms Cooperative, to address this food question in the movement. But there are youth in the same region, practically on the same street, doing the same work today, addressing these lingering questions about what we call Black food futures, about how will Black people have the ability to control when, where, and how they actually access food. 
So I'm really interested in thinking about the ways in which youth today are continuing this story to help us understand how Black people can free themselves through food. And this is not often talked about. When we talk about food around the nation, when we talk about food security, we tend to talk about these ideas around food at a more meta level or a more macro level. But what does it mean to look at the ways in which everyday people, even right now, are drawing upon the movement, but also continuing the work of the movement, but explicitly through food? So by, so by placing food at the center of the civil rights episode of the Black Freedom Movement, what I'm doing is I'm allowing us to see how the movement can speak directly to issues of food today. As we understand the movement right now, it doesn't necessarily lend itself to address explicitly the ways in which food operates or orbits the Black world, but my book allows us to look at the ways in which food enters the civil rights story and provides a pathway for us to understand how Black youth today are continuing this story to address the ways in which Black people access food. And it's an important question. The food question is extremely important because right now we have, we, we're dealing with food scarcity, even here in our nation. I find myself going to the grocery store, wanting certain items, and they're no longer available. So how do we begin to understand why is food unavailable? Who is the reason why food is unavailable? And who's actually fighting against this, uh, this unavailability or inavailability of food? So my book speaks to that directly in chapter four, this future question, by looking at the ways in Black youth provide us a way and looking forward to addressing when, where, and how Black people access and obtain food. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I want to say that there are hundreds of people listening. They eat food. They try to find food. <laughs> they are in the context of a burgeoning fitness industry and, of course, all sorts of complicated narratives about Black women and how we do and do not fit into that industry or fit into even the concept of fitness. And of course, in addition to all of the wonderful scholarly work that you offer, Therese, I think that we're probably speaking to a legion of fans of sports who have opinions, who have, who have you know, look at games and observe the industry and come to their own conclusion. So you on YouTube, I'm speaking to you right now. Hundreds of you are out there. This is your moment to write a question to our speakers. Um, right after this next set of questions, we will open it up for Q&A from the audience. And we look forward to hearing from you then. So just type that right on into the chat on YouTube. I had some lightning round questions for you all, as, although it probably has already felt like you're in a lightning round, but imagine, you know, another kind of lightning round, just set the fire under you. So um, just take a few moments to to kind of think with us around these, these issues. Well, first, Teresa, uh, your book rewrites the history of a time in basketball history that has been criticized. This ideal of street ball taking over and ruining the game. We wanted you to ruminate on that a little bit. Um, you take up this post civil rights lens on black power and basketball, but you also give us a window into a particular period and argue for a different interpretation of that period. In two minutes or less. Yeah. <laughs> two minutes or less. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, well, the thing that I noticed about the street ball conversation, the playground ball conversation, was that it was always at the center of larger moral and social debates about Black youth, Black male youth in particular, um, in the context of the urban crisis, a moment when deindustrialization, white flight, hyper policing, um, you know, the law and order. Um, uh, you know, system really impacted Black communities, and Black communities became blamed for the effect, the systemic effects of the urban crisis. So in that context, playground ball, the trash talking, the individual one-on-one -on -one, um, artistry of the players, them exemplifying joy, bravado, improvisation, all things that flew in the face of the sort of tradition, the white tradition of basketball, set plays, down on the ground, dunking as seen as too flamboyant and superfluous for the game, right? Black players were sort of piercing the veil 
of um, the kind of racialized expectations of what basketball is supposed to look like. And because they did that in this context, they were labeled as undisciplined and, um, you know, lazy. Uh, this sh this was emblematic of a wider sort of social decline in Black communities. So it became kind of part and parcel of these wider um, systemic changes in the 1970s. And they actually pushed back on those um, ideas. Um, Earl the Pearl Monroe, right, uh, one of the greats from the early 70s, basically said, look, this is a style that is born out of the deprivation that we experience um, in Black communities because of these policies and these systems that disinvest from our communities. But we've taken something that threatens our survival and we've turned it into an expression of our joy and as a kind of laboratory of Black freedom. And that's what I think is just so beautiful about you know, this moment of transition in basketball, which we sort of assume that white fans were always so excited about dunks and whatnot. But when they first came into the game, they were seen as kind of transgressive. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Bobby, this is the moment where you talk about the past and no one tries to bring you to the present. So tell us about some of the practices of food justice that the Mississippi activists that you study put forward? How did they conceive of food justice decades before we had the term? Yeah, thank you, Robin. Um, and I'll keep it as short as I can. I think for me, when I think about chapter one of my book in particular, uh, which is called Food Denied, Food for Freedom, I get into this idea of, or I talk about when food actually enters the, at least the story of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement in this way that I'm speaking of. And for me, activists were not expecting this to happen. They were used to other weapons being used against. They were used to police violence. They were used to dogs. I mean, they were used to all kinds of different type of tactics against them, but they never really conceived this idea of food being weaponized against them. While they knew that people particularly, so also my the story I tell about the past is located in the rural Black past. So it's a different context. So, so we're thinking about, when we think about rural Black life, their entire lives in, in the Mississippi Delta are all shaped by the politics of white supremacy. So when activists come into Greenwood, Mississippi, they're coming to test out their strategies in a place that's dominated more uh, visibly or publicly dominated by white supremacy. So when activists are there, they're ready to fight against physical violence. They're ready to fight against or to test some strategies against these different um, uh, preconceived notions of oppression against them. But when food enters the conversation, activists have to scramble. How do we ask people to register to vote and we can't even feed them? These people are poor. These folks are hungry. These folks are living on plantations or they're living in the city and going to plantations to work. This is, a, this is an agrarian story. So how do we get food to these people to get them to register to vote? So in chapter one of the book, they organized what we call the Food for Freedom program. And this was a national program while it was headquartered in Mississippi. Folks all the way from Compton, California to Chicago, Illinois, to New York City were all a part of this Food for Freedom program because as food had been taken away from these communities, and when I say food taken away, it was the Federal Surplus Commodities Program had been dismantled. For those who know what that program is, it's what we call government cheese, government peanut butter, government meat. And this is an important program for rural Black people in Mississippi. So as in an act of, of, of response to in, increases in voter registration drives, the, 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 the political actors there took away this program. So this ignites what we call the Greenwood Food Blockade. And one way activists had to respond was due developing a Food for Freedom program. But the Food for Freedom program was not only about getting food to people who needed the food, Black people. Activists also went all the way to Washington, D.C. and petitioned the Department of Justice and the United States Department of Agriculture to infiltrate Mississippi and force these political actors to give food back to these communities. So, so, so food enters and it surprises activists. They scramble for a minute, but then they reorganize, they develop this food for freedom program that was designed to both get food to people, but also to force the white power structure to reinstate this important food program for rural black people in the area. 
And I think, and, and what, what we see there is what I call emancipatory food power through the Food for Freedom program and throughout the rest of the chapter, chapters two and three, I talk about other ways that uh, particularly the communities took up these ideas of food. So that's one thing I found interesting was that activists were caught by surprise. They did not expect this food situation to happen. Bob Moses wrote plenty of letters to the North saying, I don't even know how to work around this, but we need food. Just send food our way to help us. And that's how they organized. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and the final question is for Ava. Uh, we wanted to ask about the title of your book, Fit Citizens, right? How does the history of Black women's fitness give us a new way to see what full citizenship looks like? Oftentimes people don't even, when you say citizen, somehow a Black body is not what comes to mind. So you put it on your cover. So we wanted you to have a moment to to talk about that. What a lovely and inviting question, Robin. Thank you so much. Um, so I titled the book Fit Citizens, Taking Cues from the Historical Actors. I have a lot of fidelity to them. And there's a way in which the title Fit Citizens is descriptive and it's also assertive. Yeah. So these Black women were saying, um, we are fit citizens. <laughs> like they, you know, they, it, it's an assertion. It's an assertion of who they are. And there's a, there's, it's so interesting because there's a way in which, you know, these are Black women who are, they're not, you know, asserting their citizenship through military service or through voting, particularly in the early parts of the book because they can't vote. Um, um, or through different kinds of state recognition, the, the ways in which we often think about citizenship, right? Voting, military service. Um, they're like, we're going to perform citizenship. We're going to exert corporal and bodily forms of literal and figurative fitness. And that is going to be enough to assert the fact that we are um, fit, we are, we are capable, we are smart, we are contributory, we are the best kind of citizen that this country can, you know, um, favor or um, accept or um, uh, admire. And so I kind of just took the cue from them and say, you know, I'm not going to name the book like Fit Citizens with a question mark or the Fit Black Body. I'm just going to be really intellectually, conceptually, corporally, epistemologically honest and just say what they were trying to um, exert and fashion. And that was we are fit in every way possible and we are citizens. And so that's where the title came from. Thank you. This is just such a lovely conversation tonight. And, um, and now we have a million great questions in the chat. And so we're gonna turn to the audience. Um, and Bobby, we're gonna start with you. There are actually a couple of questions I'm gonna give you just so, because we don't have tons of time left. Um, the first question someone wanted to know, uh, did Dr. King ever do a march around food? Um, and the second question was you, like your work around like black joy as it relates to food in the civil rights movement. Um, and so maybe starting with Dr. King and I'm finishing a book on Dr. King right now and two of the very few times where King bursts into tears is actually around food, right? Right. So, so, for, so for King, so King enters my book um, in chapter one. So the Food for Freedom program, I said, was a national program where activists were responding to this, 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 this food scarcity, food insecurity of people, uh, this engineered food insecurity, if you will. So Dr. King actually becomes one of the figures who go take goes to his pulpit demanding for food. He's saying that if you want to understand how 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 
how the anti-civil rights movie will, or how people are working against the movement. You need to look at Mississippi right now. He's talking about, he's writing, he's saying this from his pulpit in early 1963. And he's arguing that we need to get food to Mississippi because the Negroes in Mississippi are hungry because they dare to register to vote. So that the king transforms his pulpit into a site for demanding for food or calls for food. That's one time we see King enter the story. And then um King also, when he when he when he talks about the poor people's campaign, well, I took a step back. When when King goes to Chicago with Operation Breadbasket in 66, he also addresses this food question because Chicagoans are not only dealing with housing insecurity, these folks are actually also dealing with hunger. But their hunger looks a little different because they're in an the urban context. So King goes to work with Operation Breadbasket and also addresses food. And then also when he starts the poor people's campaign before he can finish it, food is also central there. So there's three moments moments in the movement where King enters the story understanding that if you want to understand what people are going through, look at their food realities and connect those to the vote. Because the same people who are in power who are getting voted in are the same people creating hunger among these people. Um, the second part is Black Joy. And in chapter three of my book about the North Bolivar County Farm Cooperative, I get excited about this cooperative because Mrs. L.C. Dorsey, an activist who's often overlooked, takes center stage. And she talks about food in a different way because she says that people wanted to do something about their situations and they knew how to grow vegetables. All they needed were the resources. They found joy in growing food. Before Black people's relationship was disrupted with food, they enjoyed doing things and growing gardens. So joy shows up, particularly in chapter three, because Black people are reimagining a previous relationship with food, and they're finding joy in something that everybody else is running from. In the late 1960s, people are running from agrarianism. They're running from the land. And these Black folks are running to the land for economic security, for food security, but also as a site of joy. So I appreciate those questions. Thank you, Jean. Thank you. Um, Ava, we have a question about white gatekeeping of exercise experiences like yoga and Pilates. Um, what have you found around the ways sort of Black women have dealt with that, negotiated that, worked around that? You know, black women are always going to find a way. <laughs> they are wayfinders. Um, yeah, you know, what I found so fascinating um, about doing research on this process, uh, on this project, par pardon me, is the way in which fitness became this like very um, protected space, liter like literally, right? Um, the ways in which like YMCA's and YWCA's were differently equipped mm -hmm. um, based on, you know, what the black YWCA had and what the white YWCA had. Um, the ways in which even kind of like less material, more ideological notions of who has access to fitness, physical fitness, um, intellectual fitness was very much um, kind of beheld uh, by white, white Americans. Um, and it's, it's really interesting because there's a way in which black women were like, well, we just want our stuff to be better. We don't necessarily want to integrate fitness spaces. You all don't want to integrate with us. That's fine. We don't want to integrate with you either. Can we please just have our own stuff? Can the white uh, YWCAs and the black YWCAs have the same kinds of equipment? Um, can we have a swimming pool? Can Just give us our resources and we'll be fine. <laughs> right? Um, and so I think, at least in my book and the way that I approach um, health equity and fitness equity is that um, African Americans and Black women in particular just very much wanted the resources to be able to um, have access to the kinds of bodies that they envisioned, the kind of health that they wanted, the kinds of recreation that they envisioned for their children. Um, and so for them, it really wasn't a story about um, integration or making sure that we can all be fit together. They just wanted their resources so that they can participate um, in this project of American fitness. Um, 
what that means for today, that's a separate um, uh, <laughs> a Zoom. Um, but historically, I think, um, you know, Black women just wanted their own facilities. They wanted their own land. They wanted their own equipment. They wanted their own resources because for them, um, fitness was an avenue, like I said before, to health and longevity and Black futurity. Thank you. Um, so Teresa, we have a question about colorism. Um, and it, how does that intersect with this, the story you're telling of kind of the post-Black power, uh, we might say, hysteria, backlash that you partly detail in your book? Um, yeah. Huh. I have to think about that one. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean... I hadn't actually thought of bringing that lens into um, conversation. Um, I mean, in terms of the backlash against Black players, mm -hmm. I mean, the place where I start the book is in 1980. There was uh, this infamous expose written by an LA Times reporter who claimed that 40 to 75% of NBA basketball players were using cocaine. So first of all, anyone who does statistics knows that 40 to 75% is quite a, you know, that's a wide range, right? Um, and, you know, this was sort of taken at face value People were calling it a study, even though the, the, the journalist who wrote it used mostly anonymous sources, mostly interviewed team owners, managers, NBA officials without actually talking to the players. Um, it came in the wake of these really high profile arrests of a couple of black players for possession of minor quantities of cocaine. Um, and out of that, they spun this huge moral panic, placing black ball players um, really at the center of this panic at a moment in 1980 when the drug was really, for the most part, the drug of the white elite. You know, where, where this was pre the quote unquote crack crisis. And yet the response um, to this kind of moral panic was a call for a kind of war on drugs in sport. And so in some ways, and again, this sort of intersects with color in the sense that the players who came to embody, you know, um, a kind of blackness of black urban communities were the ones who fell under the most scrutiny. Um, and so I'm thinking of, uh, I mean, a little bit later in the story, uh, you know, Daryl Dawkins, very dark skinned uh, black player from Florida, who got drafted into the NBA at a very young age, thanks to some of the interventions from the court cases in the early 70s. He's able to get right into the league. And the ways in which they describe him as a gorilla, you know, stalking his prey, right? All of these notions of, you know, Blackness as animalistic, were used in the case of him. There were rumors that, you know, he used drugs. And yet he also, in one of his memoirs, wrote about the fact that nobody ever talked about the players, the white players who would be on the bench with a towel over their head, trying to like, you know, not show the public that their noses were running from all the cocaine that they were using. So all of this to say that, you know, the kind of anti-Blackness that I find in this overall backlash against the players is extremely flexible. 
So on the one hand, there's ways for demonizing Black players who fit a particular kind of urban Blackness, um, who, you know, sort of epitomize a dark-skinned Blackness. For those who are lighter-skinned, there is a whole other set of stereotypes that are brought into play, particularly their proximity to white women, right? And the assumptions of them using their masculine um, uh, sort of privilege, which, you know, I'm not denying that A, players weren't using cocaine and that they weren't cavorting with white women. We know that that happened. But the question is, why did these become stories covered by the press used to paint the entire community as having these pathologies that were being exposed in this moment of continued racial integration. So I hope I sort of touched on the question of colorism, um, but I'm definitely going to have to write that one down and think about how that intersects with um, this story. Thanks so much. I wanted to share some comments from the audience. Um who are having just experiences of joy all across the racial spectrum watching uh, this wonderful presentation. So we have a comment about um, how the researchers on this panel are forward thinking and relevant um, and several comments around the question of environment, which is where I wanted to, um, to go next, which I think kind of unites Ava and Bobby's um, uh, perspectives and their research by right? thinking about the impact on a food injustice on health, nutrition, fitness um, of Black people. How do we see those kind of coming together? And because we're running out of time, I just wanted to get this other question out there, just a provocation, is thinking about the recent college, the recent ruling about college athletes unionizing um, for the first time in NCAA history, and if you could speak to that moment. So we've got three, you know, moments of intervention and also probably about three minutes. So if you could just um, give the audience a nugget to take away. Whoever wants to jump in first. I'm happy to jump in first. Um, for me, in thinking about the relationship between where the food injustice and health and nutrition in Black communities. I just want to offer one way. So when we think about the, the health outcomes or the nutritional um, aspects of Black life today, we have to read them against the backdrop of an evolving transnational global food system and that the food system has changed over time. So the food in which people were eating 50 years ago did not necessarily have the same ingredients that we're eating today. So some of the health problems we're seeing today is based on particularly eating a particular kind of way with the same kind of foods of the past, but not necessarily thinking about the ways in which the food system has changed. So what I wanna offer is when we think about the relationship between food and justice of the past or even today, and particularly the health outcomes of black people, we have to also bring in a conversation about the ways in which the food system has to also be an actor here because it changes and it's, it's, it's constructed based on a set of policies, actors, or regulations. So all I wanna offer is when we think about that question, also bring in the food system as an actor as well. I'll jump in super quick. And um, from the perspective of my work, uh, black women wanted access to food so that they can abstain from it. So I'm looking at black dieters and what does it mean to think like we can start with Bobby, right? Like weaponization access for them. They're like, well, we really want this so that we can eventually deny it, abstain from it because we want to be participating in this fitness industry. And that really bumps up to, against how we think about the relationship between food and blackness. So something I just, a nugget would be, what would it mean to give complete and total unfettered access so that some black people can say, no, thank you. <laughs> and uh, I can probably answer the question about Marsh Madness and unionization in the NCAA. By quoting Spencer Haywood, he the, he was in the days before name image likeness, the transfer portal, all of these reforms that were brought in. And he said, well, they'll they'll give you a hamburger to play for them, but not much else. And so that critique actually was all over the press 
50 years ago. <laughs> okay. So this is not a new critique. It has been a longstanding critique, particularly coming from Black ball players who bore the brunt of this system. And I think that you know, the NCAA has shown that the only way out of this quagmire is actually for the players to organize. They have not <laughs> um, listened to the critiques of players as individual voices. Maybe if the players can actually unionize, they will have to, uh, you know, actually answer to the players and their demands. Thank you so much. What a fun conversation. What an interesting conversation. What a relevant conversation. Thank you, uh, Teresa and Ava and Bobby. We are so delighted um, to have this conversation for our audience. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, just a reminder, we're back as always, first Thursday. So Thursday, May 2nd, we're online again. Um, we're going to be talking about educational injustice and the struggle for liberatory education uh, with Zebulon Maletsky, Connor Thomas-Reed, Keith Mays, and Leslie Alexander. Again, you can follow us at blackfreedomstudies.org. That's our website, and all of our back um, videos and information are there. And you can follow us um, at Schomburg CBFS. So be safe, be well, and thank you so much for being with us tonight. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful night. And don't forget to pick up these books. They're